be do we're off right <clears throat> evening everybody it is wednesday 11th of january 10 days to go until the big gala and um yes i've got lots to sort out it, there's quite a lot of things to sort out when you're talking about some kind of big event finale gala thing um more than i thought there was going to be so um yeah i hope it all falls into place um but the auction is looking very very exciting indeed i'm going to do a video possibly tomorrow night um, with the majority of the items that I've got um, so keep an eye out for that and please do tell everybody that you know because I'm going to do it as a silent auction and it's going to be um, a case of people just will be able to put in what bids they want for what items you just put one bid in this is the amount I want to pay for it and if it's the winning bid you've won it um, I'm happy to ship overseas. I will get the best value courier that I can get that's still going to get in one piece. Um, but I will make sure that there isn't any rip-offs on, on, in terms of shipping it out to wherever you may be if you're not in the UK. Um, and you could get some bargains because at the moment I've not had many bids in. Um, so it could be a case of you could put a cheeky bid in and still get it. And everything that it's sold for will go straight into the charity pot. I'm, make, I'm not taking any cut of it. It's not going towards the cost of the, uh, the night because that's being covered by the tickets. Um, so it's all, any, anything that you put in as your bid will go straight to the Children's Heart Surgery Fund. And hopefully, fingers crossed, get me through to the £5,000 because I'm on three and a half at the moment so there's not that far to go so anyway we're talking about whiskey so um, I've got two left of my world whiskies and then we are into the final stretch the final 12 whiskies all of which are Isla um, so these are the last two from the same country it's the final of my world whiskies so we've covered outside of Scotch we've obviously done a massive load of American we've done Irish we've done Luxembourg we've done Germany we've done France we've done New Zealand we've done Australia but it's really Tasmania um, we've done Japanese um, done South African just amazing to come across all these ones and um, I haven't really finished on these this particular country for a region that'll be my dishwasher being noisy it's not my stomach um, it's just the way that it's all kind of panned out and um, it'd be quite finished to, quite good to finish the world whiskies on probably what's of world whiskies outside of say American and Irish and Scotch and Japanese the next one on the list in terms of popularity so it's Taiwan um, but the first one I'm going to have is this one which is called Nantu uh, Nantu Omar so Nantu is the distillery and Nantu um, is or maybe Nantau but I'm going to go with Nantu um, Nantu is actually a, the second largest county in Taiwan and it's here um, in, in terms of this is where the distillery is but it's a part of Nantu County and it's the only county that's landlocked on in, in, in Taiwan because it's obviously an island you can tell by the map um, and Nantu is basically right in the middle of it surrounded by all other counties so um, Nantu the distillery um, was founded in 1978 um, and it's owned by a company called uh, the Taiwan Tobacco and Liquor Corporation or TTL um, and these are actually state owned this was a um, um, a, a state-owned company that was founded in 1947 um, but it had a precursor uh, I can't remember what the name of it was now that was um, started in 1901 and a, a, a TTL kind of replaced it um, and essentially up to the point of 2002 all tobacco all alcohol was controlled by this state-owned company the TTL in 2002 they wanted to join the World Trade Organization and in order to do that they had to get rid of the monopoly of the uh, tobacco and alcohol so government regulations were lifted um, to enable other companies to be able to actually produce tobacco and liquor in Taiwan and you'll see this is where Cavalan comes in but I'm going to start with Nantu because essentially this is the first this is the original although the whiskey itself came after Cavalans. So it's the two kind of intertwined, but I'm gonna do Nantu first because the distillery, the company itself was actually the, the, the first one on Taiwan. There's two distilleries on Taiwan at the moment. There's Nantu, there's Cavalan, and as far as I'm aware, that is it for now. But it wouldn't surprise me if there's some new ones already in operation, um, if not just about to release. Um, because Taiwan wh whiskey, predominantly because of Cavalan, is becoming very very popular indeed and this is the next big thing this really is kind of um, as I was saying you've got scotch you've got American stroke Irish if you were kind of like doing a league table in terms of popularity shall we say um, you've got Japanese which is up there Taiwan is getting there definitely it's getting into that top five so 
Distillery, founded in 1978, making spirits, but only started to produce malt whiskey in 2008. Um, and it was really the popularity of Cavalan, which was um, opened in 2005, and they launched their first one in 2008, which is when um, Nantu started producing, um, that encouraged TTL to go, oh, we need to get into some of this action because actually we're missing out here. So they use malted barley that's actually shipped across from Scotland and um, they can only um, produce, they, they only do their whiskey production um, between the months of uh, October and April because the Taiwan weather is so volatile and the heat between April and October is so hot they are just losing far too much. They lose, lose a lot already through evaporation but they're just using f losing far too much through the angel share. Now, it does mean that these are pretty young whiskies, but we're getting back into that argument of because of the heat, as, as the argument is with say American whiskies, because of the, the, the higher heat, you've got more interaction with wood because the, the liquid is more volatile and therefore it is aging at a quicker rate. So, you know, less time in cast, but it still tastes like it's older. We, it's, you know, I still don't know where I stand on that. There's no real scientific, um, evidence to say one way or the other to be perfectly honest and it's it's pretty much conjecture but that that's kind of where we stand now it was that um uh, nantu were releasing single cast bottlings so they were cast strength single cask it was quite hard to get hold of because they were using it predominantly in blended whiskies basically for the taiwan market however nantu omar is is almost like a new brand um, omar is a gaelic for amber um, I read one in one place where they said, oh, it's Taiwan uh, or Taiwanese for amber, to which somebody then turned around and went, well, that's a funny coincidence because it's also Gaelic for amber. So it might be that they're using it in terms of it to try and tie themselves in with Scotch whiskey heritage. There are two versions of this. The one I have is um, the bourbon cask. They do a bourbon cask and a sherry cask. And while I look at my phone, this is what the bottle looks like. Uh, Master of Malt are selling it, and they are selling it for 63 quid. Now, uh, I've actually forgotten who um, donated me this, so I will find out now. And then to Omar was, oh, it's Billy Abbott. Good friend, Billy Abbott from, just make sure that lines up. Yes, um, thank you, Billy. Billy Abbott from, um, the Whiskey Exchange, who will be joining me. I've never actually met the guy in the flesh, so on the 21st of October, it's gonna be quite an experience, because I'm gonna be meeting quite a few people I've encountered over the year, actually in the flesh for the first time, which is kind of scary. Um, but uh, yes, this was from Billy. Um, but when I did the um, Newcastle Whiskey Festival uh, and helped out on that on the table, and I was on the World Whiskey's table, they actually had the uh, bourbon and the sherry cask there. I didn't try it at the time because I was determined I wasn't gonna do any, um, try anything because I had to get the train back, I had to make sure it was compass mentis. Um, and because they only had one bottle of each and it was proving very, very popular indeed, I couldn't even pinch a sample to get away with. But fortunately, Billy's come through. So um, this isn't cash strength. This is um, this was I think it was launched last year, um, and it was it, it's a non-age statement kind of core uh, expression of their range. So it's a forty-six percent ABV, um, and like I say, uh, sixty-three quid. Now Cavalan. I don't know whether it's comparable because I couldn't really tell you. The one that I've got, I've been quite lucky to get hold of, to be honest, and it's a bit more of a premium one. So it's difficult to say whether the standard Cavalan is about that price, whether it's a competitive. Now, what I will say is the packaging, obviously you've seen the bottle, the packaging is not fantastic. Um, and one little article I was reading was basically saying, it does kind of smack of state owned, functional, not really much of a, um, don't lick my fingers, I've got whiskey on it, you idiot. Um, uh, it's kind of state-owned, not really much consideration of marketing. It's more kind of functional and a bit boring and a bit dull. What's the matter? Go sit down. Go on, bugger off. You don't want any of this. Um, whereas Cavalan is clearly, they've thought about the marketing and they, they've gone for kind of a, you know, a world market, looking very premium, looking very cool and all this lot. But ultimately, it's what's about in, in the glass. So, Amber? Yeah, it's about right, actually. Um, I, yeah, I could argue you could probably get with a little bit more golden um, to get real amber, but uh, it's not far off at all. Now, whether they've added colouring to it to make it amber is a different matter entirely. And with it being state-owned, you do have to wonder kind of like corners cut, it's bureaucracy, that sort of thing. It's all a little bit iffy, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt so there's no colouring added. 
Now, so this is the bourbon cask as opposed to the sherry cask, but this is quite nutty. It's got a definite hazelnut character to it, and um, it's like hazelnut brittle because there's a definite kind of slightly caramelized edge to it as well. Now, I'm willing to bet the sherry's probably a little bit lighter and a little bit softer. It's got, a, it's got an element of that very dark fruitcake that I associate with bourbon. It's got the slight spiciness that you wouldn't get from a sherry cask, but you do with, uh, with a bourbon cask. And the more he knows it, the more this bourbon character comes in. And the more he knows it, the more bourbon it becomes and the less kind of anything else. It's difficult, I'll be honest, if you, if you nose this blind, you would say, ah, an American whiskey, not a particularly hefty one, not a particularly rich one, but you know, you wouldn't say like it's a rye heavy bourbon, but if, you, if, if I was nosing that blind, I'd say, yeah, that's American. Maybe something like a Buffalo Trace, the slightly lighter side of bourbons. It's not massively complex, it's not massively deep, but as somebody that likes bourbon whiskey, as you probably know if you've seen my videos, it, it's a pleasant nose and it's ticking a lot of boxes for me. It could do with a bit more depth, it could do with a bit more complexity, and it could do with something to kind of say, I'm not bourbon, I'm Taiwanese whiskey, I'm something different, I'm something, and you know, it doesn't really have much of a character on its own. Weirdly, on the palate, it goes a lot more scotchy. Scotchy, scotch, scotch. It, it really is kind of, it's less bourbon. On the nose, it's really, yeah, this is a, this is a bourbon whiskey almost. Not just bourbon cats, but a bourbon whiskey. Whereas on the palate, it's much more, there's a malty character to it. There's a definite oakiness to it. The oakiness isn't overpowering, but it's quite prominent. And it becomes a scotch whiskey very very clear scotch um, and a not necessarily a cheap scotch but the oakiness that's there is just kind of knocking it down a few levels it's just making it feel like it's it's not quite blended territory but it's sort of a it's a single malt spay side that's an okay single malt spay side a fairly average one again nothing particularly outstanding that, that makes it distinct, unique, different, that says, I'm not Scotch, I'm not bourbon, I'm from Taiwan, and this is why. It doesn't have the, um, the delicacy, so we say, that I'd found with a few of the Japanese. Um, it, it, it's a massive generalization, but you know, you can sort of, in some Japanese whiskies, tell they're Japanese, likewise you can tell some are Irish, you can tell Isla's fairly obvious, you can tell bourbons, that sort of thing. This is a nose of a bourbon whiskey, you know, nose of an American whiskey, and the palate of a scotch, but a very generic scotch as well. It's a bit like the label of the bottle. It's just a bit, there's nothing wrong with it. There is nothing wrong with it at all, but the labeling is a little bit dull, as is the whiskey. It's okay, but it's not, it's not screaming out anything particularly wow, particularly, oh, this is Taiwan whiskey. Well, yes, this is very, very interesting indeed, and it doesn't taste like Scott. It doesn't really even have much of a finish. finish and what is there is, is this, this oaky, woody character just ever so slightly dominates everything else. It finishes a little bit too dry for my liking. It's a little bit too woody, a little bit too oaky. Um, but it doesn't feel like the, the oakiness is masking flavors. It doesn't feel like it's hiding any flavors that are there. It really does feel like when you first get it into your mouth and you roll it around, there is a, a very generic Scotch whiskey character. There is malt, there is a slight honey uh, note to it. There's a little bit of a kick. There's a nice heat to it, 46%. You would kind of expect that at that, that percentage. And then this wave of oak comes in and it just sort of keeps going a little bit too long and it, it just starts to overpower anything. But it doesn't feel like I'm missing out. It doesn't feel like something's hiding away where if you got rid of that oak, there'd actually be something really, really special there. It's just very, it's very ordinary. And it's, it's a bit of a shame, to be honest. Now, whether the Sherry Omar is got something to it but i have a feeling and i have a, a bad feeling that the gen almost the generic whiskey 
as, as though they're making it together and they put some in a sherry cask and some in a bourbon cask. That bit before it goes into the cask is just okay. It's an all right whiskey. You'd be perfectly fine with this. You could give this to people and I don't think they complain, but I think if you told people it was a Taiwan whiskey before you poured it for them, they would be expecting something that's not there. They would be expecting something different, something unusual. Now, I've not had the Cavalan yet, so it might be that the Cavalan is exactly the same and actually we're looking at Taiwan whiskey being fairly standard, but with all the reports and all the palaver that Cavalan's getting, it makes me, it gives me the impression that they're, on, they're doing something good here. And unfortunately, Nantu, which is pretty much riding off the coattails of Cavalan, which has seen what they've done and gone, we want some of that. But it's state owned, it's bureaucracy, it's, you know, it's government, it's red tape, it's this and that and the other. And it, it just, it's just not done right. It needs somebody to go in there and give it a big boot up the backside and goes, no, if we're gonna do it, we're gonna do this properly. Whereas this is almost whiskey made by committee, half of which don't drink whiskey. Um, and they're doing it because, well, they're doing it and they're making a lot of money, so we need to do it as well. How do we make whiskey? I'm going to read a book and then I shall find out because I don't drink whiskey myself, so I shall go and ask some friends what it should taste like before I make it. It really is kind of like whiskey by committee and it, it just hasn't got any character to it as well. It's not a bad whiskey by any stretch of the imagination. It's just not a particularly good one. It's just very, it's very middle of the road. It's kind of like the white lines in the middle of it in the middle of that. It can't get any more middle of the road. So Billy, thank you very much for that. It would be fascinating to try it blind, it, to put it on a blind tasting and have people nose it, because I think a lot of people would go, oh yeah, that's kind of bourbon -y, it's kind of American, and then taste it and go, wait, wait a minute, that's scotch, what the hell's going on? It's very, very scotchy on the palate. But interesting, thank you for that. Um, that was a bit longer than I was hoping it was going to be. Um, so I shall have a quick rinse out and I shall see you at the next one. Cheers.